you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we have an all-star panel here from Blizzard uh, to talk about the world of esports. Uh, something that uh, everyone here in the audience certainly knows of, and it's really a banner year, I think, this year for um, esports. So we're going to talk a little bit about Overwatch League, which uh, Stage Two starts this afternoon uh, on Twitch. That we're excited about. But one of the things that one of the reasons I really want to do this panel with Mike, Kim, and Nate here from Blizzard is that you know we all know Blizzard for incredible quality, incredible games for many decades, but esports has been a big uh, focus of Blizzard over the years. And I remember over a decade ago when Mike was first telling me about going to Korea and some of the phenomenon that you were seeing around esports, this is something that I know has been a passion project for you personally for many, many years. I remember back when I was at Spike, you would come in and talk about how, you know, we got to get this stuff on TV, this is the future. And this was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so maybe by way of sort of getting into this, we'll talk about what Blizzard's doing today in a little bit. but. Mike, maybe we could start off with you just sort of telling us about what you sensed very early on about esports in Korea. Um, you know, I think you saw a lot happening around StarCraft, the excitement over there, and I'm wondering if you could take us back to sort of, you know, a decade plus ago in Korea, what it was like and why you thought that was going to translate to the rest of the world. Because some people saw that and said, oh, that's unique, that's just Korea, it, it's not going to translate around the world. So what did you see back then? Well, for, I mean, first of all, it, uh, when we first made StarCraft, um, we thought it was really fun to, to watch, but um, we didn't anticipate at all what was gonna happen in Korea, and Korea wasn't really even um, a gaming market at the time. Yeah. Um, so the popularity of StarCraft completely took us by surprise, and I remember my first, uh, the first time I actually went out to, to Korea, we were celebrating two million copies of StarCraft and Brood War sold, wow. and there was gonna be this event, and. Um, I was just completely blown away by the size of the crowds that showed up to the event, the amount of um, uh, excitement and, and um, not just interest, but the audience was so aware of everything that was happening in the game. And um, as a, a game developer, it was the most amazing feeling, like being in this crowd of people watching these expert players play this game that we worked so hard on. Um, and then, um, I happened to be there with uh, a couple of other folks from the StarCraft team, including the lead programmer, Bob Fitch. And when they introduced Bob to the crowd, he got a standing ovation <laughs> because, you know, StarCraft was already um, so, uh, had already sort of permeated pop culture in Korea. Everybody knew the game, whether they were a fan of it or not. Um, and so Bob was just a celebrity. Wow. I had never seen anything like it. Um, so. Um, sort of fast forward a little bit, you know, so StarCraft kind of became, um, at the peak you had three cable channels broadcasting StarCraft uh, tournaments 24-7. It was just like, wow, that, that's incredible. Um, and it started to, um, I mean, the West was nowhere, but other places in Asia we started to see esports become, uh, start to become popular. And when uh, Warcraft 3 came out, um, Warcraft 3, I think, was even more popular as an eSport in China oh. than it was um, in Korea. And uh, why do you think, I mean, why over there? Why did it start early? Was it the, you know, the penetration of broadband? Or what, what do you think the macro trends were that were causing it? Well, in Korea in particular, the country was just coming off of a, uh, of a recession. And uh, it was right at the same, the timing just lined up in a way that um, cyber cafes started springing up and um, people were looking for something fun to do and I think StarCraft was there at the right time and um, because of the popularity of StarCraft, it drove this demand for high speed access and because the way that um, the population is so densely centered around Seoul, yeah. Um, you just started having thousands of these cyber cafes all in Seoul and it drove this kind of tech boom um, that just fed on itself when we were in the right place at the right time. Well, now I, it's... I think one of, the, one of the other kind of crazy things about it is when we were working on StarCraft, um, we never localized the game into Korean. So we actually did localize it into Japanese. So there was a Japanese version of StarCraft, but there was never a Korean version of StarCraft 
we never expected. It wasn't part of the thing. plan. Yeah, wow. And so they they were all playing in English. Incredible. Well, and then again, that was you know a decade plus ago. It's amazing now to see this you know spread around the world um, with you know new games and and you know we'll talk about Overwatch and I want to talk to you, Kim, a little bit because you smiled when Mike mentioned uh, Warcraft Three. I know that was a, a game that you love dearly, and you've been another person at Blizzard that for many, many years has been looking at esports, very passionate, and you were a player, you were, I remember early days of BlizzCon, you were, you know, shoutcasting games, and yep. involved in esports, so tell us from the player perspective, what got you so excited about esports? Was it this sense that, you know, you were seeing really skilled players, was it the community, I mean, what drew you to sort of want to be a part of the community in such a big way? Uh, so when I played Warcraft 3, I didn't know that the community existed yet. So you're just playing with friends first, and then you get really competitive with friends, and you want to get better, right? And at some point, you kind of cap out. And I, and I think there was a, a point where I just couldn't get past a certain rank. And I'm like, there's got to be a way for me to get better. And so I think that was when I started searching the internet, found um, the forums, and then eventually uh, discovered the community. And so what started it off for me, and I think for most gamers, is like, how do I become better? Mm -hmm. How do I, you know, beat these other players who have, uh, um, you know, tactics that, you know, I'm not familiar with? Um, so that's what started it. And then once I discovered the community, I actually did start playing better because I started learning new strategies. Um, and then from there, you just meet amazing people who share the same passion that you do. And then I was uh, introduced to professional gamers. So I didn't even know about pro players yet or that you could even make a living playing professionally. Um, and from through the community is how I discovered the professional players um, in Europe and in China. So I think Warcraft 3, uh, the phenomenon there really like was big in Europe. There was a lot of strong players in Korea as well, um, but then definitely in China. So the rivalry was really between Europe and China. Um, and I was fascinated at the skill level of these players. They were insane, and I wanted to try and become a pro player. Um, I don't know what I was thinking, but I tried. And so uh, from there, I just started casting because I enjoyed watching uh, high-level play and, and top-level play, and that was the only way that you could observe uh, firsthand because back then, you know, you didn't have streaming platforms. Um, to watch and so Warcraft 3 had a limitation of only eight observers could join a game at one given time yeah. um, and so uh, I, I had figured out that if you were a shoutcaster and you were invited to cast the match and you could be one of the observers that jumped in and so that's how I got into casting so I jumped in and I got to be one of the folks who basically call the shots and play by play uh, for everyone else who couldn't watch the game they just tuned in and listened like you did when there was radio now, you know, over the years, it seems like almost all of Blizzard's games have built sort of an eSport community around them. I mean, Diablo maybe is the one exception, but like, you know, now you look at your portfolio of all these incredible games. Um, I wanted to ask you, Mike, like from, you know, from the top down at Blizzard, like, has it been a strategy to sort of evolve eSport leagues around these games that very much grassroots from the community? Um, you know, obviously, they're great games, which helps the players really love them, but tell us about sort of that the evolution of you know, your view on you know, adding esports to all these games. Yeah, so um, after uh, StarCraft um, became, became popular, when we're working on Warcraft 3, we wanted to make sure there were better observer tools. Yep. So that's kind of the uh, focus that we had against Warcraft 3. Um, but when we were working on StarCraft 2, I think it was even um, a bit more uh, proactive. We, we knew that we wanted to make this an, an eSport, and so we were thinking about um, uh, how to support broadcast um, and make the game broadcast ready right, right from the beginning. Um, I think that all of our games now, we want to, uh, we think about viewability, um, and we think about uh, uh, what is, is going to be necessary from a development perspective to make sure that we're, uh, we're ready if a game uh, does take off as an eSport. When you say viewability, how do you, how do you describe what viewability is? Uh, providing tools to a observer or broadcaster to be able to, um, to present the game to an audience. Okay. That's, that's a focus where you guys will talk, like you know, Overwatch, great example, we can talk about that, but it's like you guys have evolved that game even from the launch of it. But Nate, tell us a bit about, you know, Overwatch, like the viewability, that's something that you guys have thought a lot about, right? Yeah, for sure. I think, well, I think one of the keys to having a successful eSport is you have to have 
uh, game development team that is also invested in esports and is, is passionate about the, the programs and wants to make the game uh, watchable and provide tools. I think on Overwatch, Overwatch is a particularly challenging game from a viewability perspective because it's so fast paced. I mean, if you describe Overwatch as a sport, it's essentially 12 players on the field all doing something important at all times. Uh, and so how do, you, how do you show that to a viewer? Um, the, the team's done an amazing job of putting tools in the game. The, I think the most obvious one is team uniforms. We've tried to be very thoughtful about the fact that you're not just watching a simulation of a video game, there's actually amazing pro players that are behind this. And when you watch, uh, uh, you know, Toby on the Soul Dynasty play Lucio, you can see him wearing a Soul Dynasty jersey, and then Lucio in the game is also wearing a Soul Dynasty jersey. So we're really trying to, like, put some visual cues in the game that make it easier. There's also a lot of tools, I think, that are less obvious to fans. Um, so I think the most notable, we do a lot of replays in, in Overwatch League because the action is so fast paced, we need to go back and, and look at team fights and what happened. And we actually have a tool in the game that the, the, the team built uh, that essentially has an event log and anything that happens in the game, we can go back, pull that event up, the game engine renders the replay and we can get that back on the broadcast in as little as 15 seconds. Wow. Uh, it's a pretty amazing tool and it, it's almost like if you were broadcasting a football game with infinite cameras from every angle. That's essentially what we have. So, this is for all of you guys. What do you think makes a good esports game? Because I'm sure there are a lot of developers out there, you know, everyone, everyone sort of aspire to have, you know, an esport build around their game. It ties into, you know, a game as a service that people will keep coming back and playing again and again. Um, Mike, I mean, do you have any thoughts on, like, you know, what makes a game a great esport? I mean, different genres, different qualifications, but generally, what do you think, what does it take? Well, I, I think that um, a balance of the game is very important. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has to be interesting to watch yeah. um, uh, with a high skill curve so that the people that are playing um, are able to do things that um, help you be better. Yeah, I would agree. I think that with games, like you have several different types of audiences, right? The core audience are those who are also playing the game. So yeah. they, they want to see things that maybe someone who is not familiar with the game doesn't want to see. Um, and so I think that the game has to be competitive. I mean, it's a competition. So you need to be able to uh, wit witness skill, at least for someone who's playing the game already. Um, and that's number one. And of course, what we keep talking about is, is spectator ability to view, right? And to be able to watch, especially if you want to draw a greater audience or if uh, I'm watching and I want my friend to, to join in and watch. I want to be able to explain what's happening without having to tell them how to play the game. Hopefully they can just see, for example, with StarCraft, there's just two armies. I can just say there's a blue army and the red army. When you start seeing the blue army destroy the red army, you know that they're winning. So it's kind of easy for them to cheer and, and, and yep. join in. Um, but it's the intricacies of like, crazy moves that the players do, you know, when banelings come unburrowed or I don't know, I mean, you, you just watch it and you're in awe that a player is able to maneuver in that way. Yeah, I think, I mean, <clears throat> the simplest way to say it is the game has to be easy to learn but difficult to master. Uh, like, I can explain to you, all right, on, on this map on Overwatch, Team A is going to try to push the car and Team B is going to try to stop it. It's very simple. Uh, but there's so much more depth than that. And, and the... I think it has to be a game where you can explain the rules very simply, um, but if once a fan gets hooked, there's sort of infinite places where they can go and, and, and go deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, I think that's incredibly key. And then what Kim mentioned, I think, is uh, almost most important, which is it has to be very obvious to the player at home. Well, first, the game needs to look like when I play it at home. It needs to look the same when I watch it as when I play it at home. And then it needs to be very obvious to me how that guy is better than I am. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, Overwatch is particularly strong in that. Like when you watch Birdring play Widowmaker, it's very obvious he's better <laughs> than you at Widowmaker. There's no question in your mind. Uh, and I think that's really important that's uh, for success, exactly. successfully scoring. Let's talk a bit about the sort of structure of esports at Blizzard, because I think there are a lot of publishers here that are toying with, you know, should we build our own league, should we partner with a third party, you know, there are a bunch of different models, and you guys, I think, have explored all of them over the years in terms of ways to structure esports, and, and even though Overwatch is, you know, certainly lots of buzz and press around that, there's a lot of other things going on at Blizzard Esports, so maybe could you guys take us through sort of, you know, what your philosophy is behind esports, how you structure, you know, what you're going to do yourself, who you're going to partner with, and, and what it looks like today? Um, I think that Blizzard is in a unique uh, position where we have multiple games and multiple genres and multiple yeah. esports titles. 
um, we have five that we are working with. And so um, there are five different games, five different genres, but we also, of course, started with StarCraft, where I think the community took that game and made it an eSport before we even realized that it was an eSport. So um, we've learned a lot along the way from how our community chooses to watch and play the game. Um, we've also uh, tried to you know, uh, work with partners who also are very passionate about our games and run tournaments. We have great partners that have helped you know, build the community and, and show us what competition can look like. And I think through it all, we've learned what, uh, what we enjoy watching and what we enjoy playing. And I think that uh, we've gotten better. And of course, with Overwatch, we, it was very deliberate that we went in um, with what we've learned to try and introduce what we think would make a great esports. So uh, we, at the end of the day, it's, it's unique to that community. I don't think you can take what we do for one esports title and try to apply it to another. It just wouldn't work that way. You know, it's like taking soccer and trying to make it work for, for basketball. Um, uh, StarCraft is very special in, in RTS and, you know, World of Warcraft, people didn't even think that could be an esports, but we have a very competitive element with PvP in the arena. Um, and then, of course, Heroes is a team base, Hearthstone is a card game, and then Overwatch is like this really fast-paced, high-action game. Yeah, I mean, o Overwatch League was <clears throat> uh, more deliberate, I think, than maybe we've done esports in the past. And the idea was really, let's, let's take sort of best practices from traditional sports, you know, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, who gave the keynote last year, and, and Ray, and uh, myself, and uh, sort of all, all the folks working on Overwatch are huge sports fans. And the idea was like, well, what if we, what if we took this opportunity, Blizzard's first new IP in 17 years, an opportunity to really like do something different from the beginning of a game's life cycle, uh, and sort of take best practices from traditional sports, can we apply that to esports, and really set out to build frankly, b build a business around the sport of Overwatch that's sort of outside uh, uh, of the game. And it's a very different path than we've taken in the past. I think we've, we've learned a lot along the way. Uh, uh, we you know, launched back in January. Um, it's been uh, a really good launch so far. And I, I think one of the things um, that we've been really proud of is to see with the model that we've chosen, more of this traditional sports model, city-based teams, uh, uh, so I'm sure a lot of people have read, but you know, we sold franchises, so all of our teams have a, a permanent spot in the league based in a city. Uh, and seeing you know, almost on a weekly basis these huge viewing parties, you know, 800 people in Houston and 400 people packed into a bar in New York, and uh, uh, that sort of regionality that uh, you know, we frankly took a chance on it, you know, yep. uh, uh, unproven in esports, but uh, it's playing out really well, and we're hearing from fans all over the world that um, you know I hadn't really got into esports before. I was more of a casual player. It seemed really hardcore to me, um, but I'm from New York, and you have a Boston team, so I already know who my enemy is. Uh, <laughs> and it you know it, give, it gives them a, a reason to care, and it's really cool to see that uh, catch on. I think it's great too. I still remember um, when we first even started talking about Overwatch esports and what we wanted it to be. I mean, that was probably the first game where we were, you know brainstorming and building out what Overwatch Esports would look like while the game was in development, like well before. And it was way earlier than we have done with any other game. Um, one of our core values at Blizzard is gameplay first. And so we've always focused on making a great game. Because at the end of the day, you're not gonna have a good esport if you don't have a good game. And so the priority of the, of the organization was always, let's build a really awesome game. Um, and then the esports uh, team would try and think about how we could create an esports program but you, you're always kind of waiting to see how the game is going to develop. And as soon yeah. as it goes in alpha or beta, you've got the community already starting tournaments before you know, we were even able to build something. But with Overwatch, we had, uh, it, it was very intentional to try and start early and plan out what we wanted to do so that when the game came out, we would have something ready. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that you can't explore. I think that we, uh, we value and love our community and we uh, appreciate the partners that we've worked with, but then we just have to find different opportunities where we can experiment and try something different. And uh, one example of that is probably with you know, Heroes. Heroes of the Storm, we wanted to try something unique with uh, the, our collegiate program, and we did Heroes of the Dorm. Yep. Um, and that was uh, kind of similar to city-based, but it's more college-based, so uh, mimicking um, college March Madness. We wanted to have teams from different schools uh, compete against each other, and it was great. Like there were a lot of folks that were able to engage because they are cheering for Berkeley or ASU, or uh, you know, you didn't really have to understand the game as much to really cheer for the the, the school that you yeah. were affiliated with. 
No, and it definitely seems like there is a trend for publishers generally to sort of vertically integrate a little more, do their own league, you know, then you can tie it more directly to what you're doing with game development, things like that, you know. Overwatch League, I think some of the things you're doing we're going to talk about with Twitch and other things I think only sort of really happen when the, you know, the league is run by the publisher. So going forward, I mean, you know, Mike, where do you see it, you know, five years from now? Do you think most publishers are, you know, is esports kind of part of the development of these games now and that's how it's going to work best? Or do you think are there still models where there'll be third party leagues that, you know, like Valve has taken a different approach in terms of how I, they do it? I, I don't think that there's necessarily one right approach, yeah. but I do think that um, it's sort of like when you think about traditional sports, you think about the game of baseball. Yep. And it's really hard to separate that from Major League Baseball and the World Series and the yeah. kind of impact that having a successful league, a professional league, um, has on the entire ecosystem of, you know, baseball throughout the world, or you know, use soccer as maybe a more international example. Yeah. Um, I think that if for us, you know, we're trying to create genre-defining games, you know, um, and if you're going to make a competitive game and you want it to be you know, one of the best games in the world, I think you have to have a healthy esports e e e ecosystem around the game. Yep. No, and it allows also, you know, these games become more and more like services, which you guys have seen with all your titles now, where it's like people are playing them year-round. They're watching esports year-round. Um, speaking of that, uh, Overwatch League, uh, the second stage starts this afternoon out in Burbank at uh, your incredible studio, Nate. Um, I know we've got a little sneak peek, I think, at uh, that, right? Yeah, yeah, so uh, stage two, four o'clock today, uh, and we brought a little uh, sizzle reel to show you uh, what you can look forward to. Maybe. Cue uh -huh. video. Focus up, guys, focus up. We have the best players, we have the best fans. Going in the game. Going to three, on three. We wanted to make sure that all the best players in the world were in the league, regardless of where they're from. You're really starting to see everybody really wants to up their game. Three, two, one, and live. Welcome to the party. Oh my goodness! No! <laughs> so many stars on this lineup. This is where we see the high quality Overwatch, everybody. Enough of the fun and games, it's time to get the job done. Amazing. And that's uh, at the old uh, Tonight Show studio in Burbank. I've been up there. It's an incredible facility that you guys have built uh, for, you know, not just the tournaments, but I mean the production around it and everything is really world class. Um, you know, as everyone saw there, there's a lot of excitement around it. Uh, you know, city-based teams. We have a couple of the owners actually coming up next. Um, uh, Jack and Kevin will talk about their teams and the investment that they've made in it. Um, I mean, Nate, you're a couple of weeks in. What? How's it going? I mean, you know, I'm sure there are things that you've learned that have gone great. I mean, what are some of the things that haven't worked out, or what can you tell us about sort of you know where you're at right now? Uh, well, I mean, it's going really well. I think basically one I would recommend anyone who hasn't been to a live eSport event yet, you should definitely go check it out. I think it's one of those, I, I was never a soccer fan until I went to a Premier League game in London and then I was like, oh, I get it. Uh, and I think it's the sort, same sort of thing around eSports. Like if you haven't been to an event, if you come to Blizzard Arena, you're going to see 550 fans losing their minds, going crazy, high-fiving, hugging, and the same thing that you would see in a traditional sports event. Uh, so you should definitely come check it out if you can. But I, I think. Uh, we've learned, we've been learning a lot. We've been, you know, I think we're going to build Overwatch League in the same way that we build our games, which is to iterate and continue to, to make them better and learn uh, uh, from the community. I think we've already made quite a few changes. We, we just announced some schedule changes, for instance. Uh, basically, we're making a, a live, you know, TV show four days a week, right? And we have a, a production team. We have all the players uh, based there. There's, there's a lot that goes into it. And so we've been... 16 games. I mean, it's a massive... It's, it's, a, it's a ton of content. Um, but there's something that we've seen uh, that I think is, you really only get from a league structure in esports is we're really building like regular viewership and appointment viewing 
around the games. I think I've been an esports fan a long time, and I think it's actually you've had to work to be an esport fan over the last two decades. Uh, there was no sort of central place, like there was no ESPN of esports where you could just go and you could see all the schedules and stats and etc. Uh, and so what we want to do in the Overwatch League is really build that consistency where you know if it's Wednesday and it's four o'clock, Overwatch League uh, is on Twitch and I can go there and watch it. And, um, we, we, you know, we've seen a great response from the community in terms of uh, viewership. We've been really pleased with that, and we're excited. We just announced this morning uh, when you uh, go to Twitch and you watch, you log in with your Battle.net ID, uh, you'll earn league tokens, which you can redeem for skins. Uh, something we've heard, you know, we've seen with great success, like Valve most notably has done an amazing job with just drops and events and, and things like that. And so now uh, you'll earn league tokens, and you can also, when you're logged in and watching, you have the uh, um, chance to win a, a big drop of lead tokens as well that you can redeem for skins. Uh, we also have a cheer mode program that we're uh, uh, doing with Twitch as well, uh, where fans can sort of buy uh, cheers that they use uh, in chat. Um, so we're, we're really trying to work uh, with Twitch as a partner uh, to, to evolve the, the viewing experience and, 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 again, like really grow the, the business around, around watching uh, Overwatch. No, and it's, you know, a massive business, like everyone's read the numbers in terms of what these owners have had to invest, what Twitch has had to invest to sort of be a part of this. Um, I mean, was there ever a fear that you were sort of going too big, too fast with it? Or, I mean, it was, you know, it put a big stake in the ground, it seems like it's going well, but it's, there's a, you know, there was a lot. I, mean, I, I think we, I, I don't, don't really view them as investors, view them as partners. Yeah. Um, like, it's, it's really amazing to have the ownership group that we have. I mean, first and foremost, when we, did, when we designed the Overwatch League, we came with the structure, we thought it was a pretty good structure. Um, but one of the key ingredients in making it successful was having great team owners, professional team owners, that were gonna invest in the infrastructure around the players, we're gonna treat the players well. Uh, it doesn't take much to you know, do a Google search and find you know, thousands of articles about players being mistreated and all kinds yeah. of problems. We wanna have professional owners, and, and now I can, uh, you know, if I have a, a question about a venue, I can call AEG, who owns one of our teams. Yeah. If we have a, a, you know, for instance, you, you might have, uh, if you live in Boston, uh, the local Boston radio stations are now talking about Overwatch League uh, and giving uprising scores, and it helps that Bob Kraft owns an Overwatch team. Like, yeah. uh, having those sorts of resources available to us, and what we've seen, which is really incredible, and I think you'll see it when you talk to Jack and Kevin here in a minute, um, our owners are all in on this too. Like, they're, they're not being passive. They're actively involved. We have. Uh, two owner meetings a year where we get all the owners together, uh, regular you know, calls and updates with them, and we're, we really view it as so we're building this league along yeah. with our owners. And Twitch, uh, I think, is also another great example of a partner right. that we view as you know, strategically very important. That's what we're doing on the Overwatch League, and we're really partnering with them to try to level up the overall uh, esports viewing experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's an incredible undertaking. Um, one question for you is about sort of the audience that's watching esports and watching this. So, you know, Overwatch, you know, 30 plus million people playing Overwatch. I mean, it's been a hugely successful game. And I think one thing coming from a TV background, there was always a sense of going after these sort of mythical mainstream viewers that may not play a game to watch, whether it's an award show or something I do on TV or esports. And I think one thing that I've at least felt over the past few years is that to start, getting you know, that base of 30 plus million people to tune in and to care is more than enough to sort of build and sustain something. So I wanted to ask you, I mean, the people that are watching Overwatch League, are they sort of 100% people that play Overwatch, do you think? Is that okay? I mean, what's- Yeah, I'll know? tell you that our focus right now is to turn everyone who plays Overwatch or who has ever played Overwatch into a fan of the Overwatch League. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think from there, once we do that, I think we'll be in an amazing position. If we have yeah. over 35 million people watching the Rush League, I think we'll be very happy. Yeah. Um, but I think there is a world where you can bring in people who maybe tried it and don't play anymore, maybe people yeah. play other games in the genre, maybe people who just like competition. At the end of the day, uh, it's an exciting competition. And I think the way that we do that is storytelling. I think you'll hear uh, Kevin Chu, uh, who owns the Soul Dynasty here on the next panel, talk about the huge fan base that they have back in Korea. Yeah. Um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of female fans. Predominantly right? female, yeah. actually. And, and, and what's interesting to those fans is different than what's interesting to s kids from San Francisco who like the San Francisco Shock. So yeah. we've taken this approach. We've actually hired on uh, uh, Korean language and Mandarin language talent 
We're actually producing content that most of you in this room will never see that's just for those markets because the type of content that they like around the players is very different than the type of content that European and North American fans like. So we think storytelling is a way to start to broaden that audience and, and get more uh, casual fans engaged, but it's definitely not our focus early on to go after the, the mythical, you know, sort of uh, random person who's going to watch this yeah. on Twitch. We really want to make this an awesome product for people who like and play Overwatch and then go from there. Mm -hmm. And there's so much content. Um, I mean, is the hope that people are obviously playing the game more, not less, because they're seeing these games? I mean, tell us about sort of that journey for a player um, of an Overwatch player. Yeah. I well, Kim touched on this earlier, and it's a really important point for the, for the room. Like, in the same reason that uh, the only reason that I ever watch golf on TV is because I also play golf sometimes. And when I go play golf, I'm not very good and it's frustrating and I want to get better. So how do I get better? Well, I go watch the best in the world do it and then I see them do amazing and that inspires me to then go play again and try that out. It's the same sort of loop I think that you yeah. see with, with esports. Like uh, if I play Overwatch and I'm, I'm a gold level Widowmaker, uh, I want to go watch a pro Widowmaker, that's going to inspire me. I, I hear so many times when I'm walking around the Blizzard Arena and talking to fans, they'll say to me, oh my God, I just want to go home and play Overwatch. Wow. Uh, and, and there's something about watching the best players in the world, watching them do what they do, that inspires you to then go home and try that. And I think that's incredibly important uh, a part. Uh, I think Mike touched on this earlier, like having an active esports ecosystem around your game is incredibly important for the health of the game for just that reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, that sort of extends to the broadcast. You know, I've, I know from Game Awards, like focusing on all digital seems to be work really well for what we've done. For you guys, you know, I think everyone wondered all these dollars around. It's like, are they going to do some big television deal where we're going to see it on network TV? And it, you guys went, you know, sort of all digital, at least initially, with Twitch. And I think some of the things you're talking about with the in stream incentives and everything, I think it can sort of bring it all to life in an interactive um, fashion. Mike, I wanted to ask you, like, as you see, you know, sort of esports evolving. Um, you know, at the end of the day, people are still, you know, often watching a linear video feed. And do you see, I mean, down the road, are things going to become kind of more interactive because you're in digital and allow more ways to sort of participate? There's, there's definitely the opportunity for that. And I think yeah. what, what Valve has done um, is, is pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, I think that you're going to see a whole bunch of uh, different elements. I don't know that the interactive uh, viewing experience is for everybody, right. but I think there is a core that really wants to get in and have that much control over their experience. Yep. Yeah, yeah you're right, because even like the Half-Life TV stuff where you can just watch from within the game and be a part of it, I mean, that's, you know, you're dealing with all this digital content, that's what's exciting. But I think most people, they're, they're going to want to sit and, and yeah. have professionals have give them, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the, the best professionally produced experience and, and yeah. sort of teach them what's happening with the game and also uh, uh, make sure they don't miss any of the action. Mm -hmm. Now, as things grow with something like Overwatch League or some of the other esports, you mentioned, Nate, like how do we bring sort of more people into the fold? And I think, you know, a lot of teams and a lot of leagues have done good work with, you know, documentaries behind the scenes, or we've talked about the fan bases. Um, are there other aspects, do you think, that are going to evolve kind of around this with the human interest stories and things like that? And, I, you know, Mike, you've seen that firsthand, Kim, too, with, you know, some of the fans, certainly overseas and the telling me stories about, you know, the, the going away party for the, the Soul team when, you know, 1,500 women showed up to wish them well on their journey. Um, 1,493. <laughs> That's true. They're very close to 100%. Um, where, where does that evolve, Mike, from a storytelling perspective? You guys are great at making games, but do you aspire to sort of figure out how you can tell stories sort of outside of the game about the players, too? I think there's um, maybe two elements of that. There's, yeah. I think, work that we can do in broadcast um, with the Overwatch League, um, you know, in another other broad set broadcasts with our other games. But I think um, the way that the Overwatch League is structured also provides the opportunity for um, the team owners to really get behind and promote their their players and build celebrities out of their players to their home fans, you know, and that's what I think. Um, in traditional sports, traditional sports teams are exceptional at. Yep. Yeah, one, one thing that's been super encouraging to me, one of the most exciting things early on in the life of the Overwatch League is uh, how many families are coming out to Blizzard Arena to watch it, how many little kids we see there. Um, it's unclear if they're bringing their parents or if their parents are bringing <laughs> them. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of both. Um, but there, there, there's, you know, the, the vision of the Overwatch League long term is that we bring 
the ability to go engage with this content live and connect with other fans, the more fans around the world. Once, once our teams go to home and away and we're playing, when Seoul plays London and that game's played in either Seoul and London, we think that's really when this is going to take off. Uh, and, you know, uh, Stan Kroenke, who owns the LA Gladiators, also owns the LA Rams and Arsenal and a bunch of other things. He said, uh, one of our first meetings with him, he said, I, I don't play games, I don't really understand esports, but I know that kids watch what they grow up with. And I know that kids are growing up watching this. Yeah. Um, and I think it sort of ties to your question around digital. I think, you know, this is a, 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 this is a digital native sport. Yep. And, you know, we, we have a, a very young audience around Overwatch. Uh, we have a, a big console player base in North America and Europe that, um, you know, has, has a lot of younger players. And we're really encouraged on, on seeing how many of them are, are looking up to our, pro, our pros. And it's really sort of turning the Overwatch League into this aspirational... Uh, goal, not too dissimilar from when I was growing up, sorry, when I was growing up and playing Little League Baseball and I wanted to be a Major League Baseball player, I think we're now seeing a, a generation of kids growing up who want to be the next Overwatch League pro. And male and female kids, uh, you know, we're excited. Stage two, uh, Gaguri will soon be with us, hopefully. Um, when the first female player in Overwatch League, we're seeing some great stories recently of, uh, you know, strong female players. Um, esports, that's one of the great things, I think, because it's digital, we can literally have, you know, anyone compete. Um, tell us a bit about, you know, the, the opportunity there, uh, you know, Scarlet IEM winning. Um, Mike, is that something, Kim, I'd love to get your thoughts on sort of like, you know, where is this gonna go and, and riffing off what Phil said this morning so eloquently about diversity in our industry. Think about that, Blizzard's always tried to be very inclusive with its games. Um, is there more to do there? How, how do we sort of stoke that so it's not just the first one in, in Overwatch League, but, you know, half the players? Yeah, I think it comes, a, a lot of this comes down to uh, uh, the sort of welcoming environment that it is for, uh, for women and, and other minorities. Um, I think uh, in Phil's talk, he sort of touched on that, but I do think toxicity is a huge, huge problem that we have to attack as an industry. Um, and just make it more welcoming for talented women players to feel comfortable pursuing a career in esports. I can, you know, Kim can talk about this, but on the back end, in terms of women going into a career, um, helping us run esports mm -hmm. and esports events and all of the positions that it takes to run that, we're at around 35, 40% across Blizzard Esports and Overwatch League, 35, 40% female, which is a great improvement, right? Yeah. And so I think as you start to get more women uh, in esports and more women competing, hopefully we'll see that start to change. Yeah, I definitely think that um, it needs to be, there's, there's work to be done in all different angles. I think it's amazing to have Kaguri be the first uh, professional Overwatch League player, but we're not just seeing it in Overwatch. We saw Scarlett uh, win IEM uh, Pyeongchang, which was amazing. She's, you know, the first woman to win a StarCraft title. Um, and you know, we when we started long before that, like now having more women uh, commentate as well. You know, that wasn't common before. I think when I was commentating, I was the only the one pioneer. that I really knew about. Um, but today, you have Zoe for Overwatch, you have Gilly Weed for Heroes, um, and then of course on the behind the scenes, we we do. I'm very proud of how many women we have working on our esports team and also on Overwatch. Um, it's probably the, a bigger percentage than you know other departments in the company. So yeah. I think as you're getting more women involved, um, they're introducing it to their friends, um, and it's kind of what Nate touched upon. Uh, I think if you're a professional, I mean, if you're a woman gamer and you see another woman being a pro player, like that, that inspires you. It makes you want to try and be better, and it gives you this like hope that well maybe I can do that because someone else has. And, you know, and we've seen a lot of amazing women in all of our games, even like Hearthstone. Um, it's just how do we get more to feel, uh, you know, that inspiration to just keep playing and, and competing. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, six seconds to go. That was good. Uh, Mike, Kim, Nate, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, make sure to tune in to uh, Overwatch League Stage 2 starting at uh, 4 o'clock Pacific on Twitch. And we uh, look forward to where you guys take uh, esports next. Appreciate it. Thanks, thank guys. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Nate. Thanks. All right, and now we're going to transition right over to 